welcome. Okay, so who's, the video last night, I asked a question. Who could use an extra thousand bucks a month? Yes, is that three, 10? Those are legitimate numbers that I've made in wholesaling. And it's month over month, it happens. I work with um, 381 cash buyers and we close deals. 40% of my business is wholesaling. And from, I'll tell you my story over here in a few minutes, but for six years I supported our family 100% on wholesaling. So right now, but before we get into class, um, one of the things I did say I was gonna talk about was some observations in the market regarding wholesale properties and deals and just, I, I belong to a mastermind with a couple of my buddies that we've, we've been doing. Those two guys have approximately done uh, 10,000 wholesales each. I play golf with them we, and we talk. One guy spends $10,000 plus a month on Facebook and Google ads to get deals. And the other guy spends zero dollars a month and closes that many deals. I'm of the object of, I like to keep the money that we make. If you guys are a fan, let, let's keep the money. That, that's actually called earnings. We like to keep that. Huh. That's what he spends. At least. At least. I have other friends that spend 20, 20 grand a month on that. So, And then they also bought into, uh, you guys seen the We Buy Ugly Houses things? Mm -hmm. That franchise is only $250,000 to buy into. And you have to spend at least uh, ten to twenty thousand dollars a month in advertising fees, and then you pay them again an additional three percent on any project that you purchase. So there's a lot of fees associated. So I want to kind of just kind of put the vibe out of this is possible to do with all you need is a cell phone and a computer, and if you're willing to do the work. That that's really the the knack of it. I've been teaching this class for eighteen months. Those who come in here, take it, ingest it. I've had people step through the class multiple times, three, four, five times, and that's okay. I want you to come and get information. The people that actually run with this, they're making money. So it, it works. Uh, those who have taken this class plus a master class thus far, I just started doing master classes last year, about six months ago. Um, they have earned, I think we've had 20, uh, $150,000 in wholesale earnings uh, that have been split up within the group. So that's for the last, what we've done in the last six months. That's profit without spending advertising money. All right. Now, who can tell me, how, how many of you are licensed realtors? Okay. How long have you guys been in the business longer than six months? Cool, longer than two years. Good, some veterans in here, awesome. And we have some newbies, that's great. This is a great mix, we're gonna have a fun time today. Let's, uh, this question is for kind of those that have been around a little bit longer. What's been happening in our market the past three years? It keeps going up. Is it a buyer's market or seller's market right now? Sellers. Sellers. Slightly. Yeah, slightly <laughs> favoring the seller, that's a good point. Have you noticed on the MLS how many piece of shit houses are on there that would not have sold before that are now selling on the MLS. Sorry, I sometimes say my words slow, so forgive me if I hurt your feelings. Um, there's a lot of them out there, right? Those were the ones that we would predominantly, six, eight years ago, be capturing on a cash basis. Because the lack of inventory, which right now, today I checked it, we're just under 23,000 listings. When you pull it up on your MLS, that's something that kind of, a wise old realtor kind of told me, hey, watch this. This is gonna give you indication of where the market's going. When I got licensed five years ago, we were at 33,000. So being that we're at 23, we're still at about a little bit more than a three month supply. At 33, we're at a four and a half month supply. So that still tells us it's still a seller's market, mostly. There's pockets where it's buyers, but mostly. So that means that trying to find new sales, does it, does it make it harder or easier? A little bit harder. So the reason I'm telling you this is when the market goes way up, what happens next? Usually. Prices fall. Yes. 
What happened in 2006, 2008? Right? We made an absolute gobble of money in wholesaling at that point. So if you are willing to do the work and hone your skill set now, where it's a little tougher, I'm not saying it's hard. I get deals every day. We see deals all the time. It happens. It's possible. People are doing it. People have taken our classes are doing it. So it's not impossible. But if you're willing to work hard now, when the time comes when the market changes, you will have a massive advantage over everyone else that's going to be trying to pull this off. So it's a good thing you're here today. I'm really happy you're here today. Um, with that, we'll kind of get rolling. I wanted to just kind of give you a snapshot of what we're seeing. Because does that align with what pretty much veterans in the room are saying? Okay. Hopefully the house is in 2019. I'm happy to be here. I'm excited. You're going to hear my passion because this is one of the things I am most passionate about. Here's our plan for the day. We're going to go through an intro. We're going to talk about entrepreneur mindset, investors, what the heck is a wholesale, how to identify wholesale properties, the offer process and contract. Hey, welcome. Glad you're here. Thank you. Exit strategies, assignment versus double escrow, resources, and I threw in some extra fun stuff about joint ventures. We're going to talk about that a little bit today, too. Um, as we go, if you have questions, please stop me. I want to make sure you understand. Okay? So here's my story. I grew up in a back of a truck that looked very similar to this. Uh, it's a 1958 Chevy Suburban. It was my dad's truck. We lived here in Arizona. Ask me if it had air conditioning. <laughs> no, it did not. On the other side of this truck, which is not seen here, there's no back door. It only had three doors. So. Being that I was the oldest, I'd have to get in the back seat, and scooch my butt all the way across to let the brother and sister get in. So it was very inconvenient and very not a fun journey. The reason I show you this is I want to tell you, I came from nothing. We came, we were poor. My dad was a confident man. We didn't take from the government. We would eat powdered milk. We did what we had to survive, which I'm thankful for because it taught me work ethic. As I grew up, he started saying he tries. Now that you're a man at the age of 10, I want you to start coming to work with me on Saturdays. So I started doing rehabs and remodels with my old man at that point in time. So I would learn about drywall and how heavy it is. I learned about roofing and how much it sucks to do that in July. I learned about electrical and how it hurts if you grab a hold of the live wire. So I learned those skill sets. I learned how to frame. My, I, as I grew, my responsibilities in that changed. By the time I was 16, I was going to school, working in the kitchen, cooking, making some money, and then I was making 10 bucks an hour. Oh, I know. I'm old. I'm 44, so that was 30, almost 30 years ago. I was making 10 bucks an hour, which was my buddies like, how did you do that? I'm making four. I'm like, because I'm strong, and I'm on the roof with OSB. It was not fun was not fun work, but I learned. And my dad kept telling me, son, you see how hard it is for work with your body? Yeah, he's like, work with your mind. Learn to work with your mind. So, I worked hard in school. Um, reason being, yeah, my dad kind of told me that, but if, if you follow, if you stalk me on Facebook, you'll notice that I'm in love with a beautiful redhead. Mm -hmm. uh, we met in high school at church, started dating, fell in love, and I knew I needed to have a better plan. So I busted my butt on my grades, got good grades, got a scholarship, went to NAU, got a undergrad degree in communications because you, we all know if you have an undergrad degree, you're freaking gonna rock, right? You're gonna make so much money, like no worries, you're just gonna be set for life, right? Well, that was my understanding. I was the first one in our family ever to get an undergraduate degree. So when we graduated, my hot wife was a teacher. She graduated making $22,000 a year. I graduated with a rocking communications degree making $19,000 a year. We thought we were set. We thought we were, man, we're making the big time. Better than cooking in the kitchen, better, better than working outside. Well, after you're married a couple years, what happens? Money's money enough. Money's money enough. Babies. <laughs> You can try to give her a dog and try to kind of postpone that a little bit, get her another dog. And so that's for the guys in the room, give you a little nugget. Uh, <laughs> anyways, she wanted to have babies. I wanted to have babies. 
And I'm looking at the budget, and I'm looking at our house at the time, I'm going, how is this going to work? I got my golden. At that point, I had gotten a little bit of a raise. I think I was at 25. And uh, we were at a Bible study, and I was kind of bemoaning this situation with a buddy of mine. And he's like, Travis, I know your skill set. You've been in the building forever. Come work with us at UBC Homes. So I became, uh, I got a job, got an offer, big, huge raise to $33,000 a year. And my official title was cock bitch. So I ran around with a cocking gun and a paintbrush. I was like, ah, let me get this. And, oh my gosh, let me get that. And Mr. and Mrs. whatever, I'll help you, whatever. I was the guy, the last face they saw before they went to pay, to title and sign paperwork. Has anyone heard of the community called McDowell Mountain Ranch? I was there. I was on that project. Anybody heard of DC Ranch? I was on that project. That's where I started with, with, uh, with UDC. Well, as all things happen, things transpire. And UDC sell, sold out to Shea and Standard Pacific. I went on the Standard Pacific side. And I was growing in the company. I got promoted from Cockpitch to assistant superintendent. So I was in charge of the back end from drywall through the end of production. So I was really good with the trades, got to know people. I'm a little outgoing personality, I can talk to people. And it really started rolling. My numbers got good, my customer service scores were great. So they're like, Travis, you're doing great. We're gonna put you in training to become a superintendent. I'm like, superintendents make $60,000 a year. That's so much money, we're gonna be so set. So they're like, well, you just keep working hard. We're gonna get you there. So in my logic, I'm like, you know, if I would have a master's degree, they would have no choice but just roll out the red carpet and say, Travis, come on, you get to go to the top of the line. So I was dumbass and signed up for a master's degree in business. And not only did I do it, I did it at the most expensive place that you could ever imagine. So I took on massive debt to get an MBA. Spent two years, my ba our babies were little, worked my butt off, worked full time, went to school full time, took me two years, knocked it out. Graduated, I had to write a thesis statement. The thesis statement was how if Standard Pacific would buy this plot of land that I found and identified off of Carefree Highway and I-17, they were to buy this land and put a semi-custom product up there, they would kill it. They'd make Google millions, blah, blah, blah. I had all the research, I had pie charts, I had bar graphs. I had the whole bit laid out. This paper was 120 pages long. Indexed, bound, spiraled. I got an A plus. I had the best grade in the class. My professor was like, you rock. You should totally go talk to your, to your boss about this. So that's what I did. I scheduled an appointment with the vice president of construction. Spent an hour with him. Had a PowerPoint presentation. Gave him a copy. Talked through the whole thing. He asked me a few questions. And then as I get to the end, he goes, you know, Travis, you're a young man. You're 25 years old. I said, yeah. He goes, I don't know if you know this, but I hope you understand. You are the youngest assistant superintendent, not only here in Arizona, but also in California and Texas, across the Western United States. You're a go-getter, and I appreciate that. But you have to understand, the people you're trying to get to a superintendent level, you just have to wait your turn. Doesn't matter that your customer service skills are the best. Doesn't matter that your numbers are the best. I don't have a spot for you and you're just gonna have to wait. Well, in this company, people would die and then a spot would come available. I'm like, this isn't right. So I, I came home heartbroken. And I was like, God, what, what the heck? Kirsten, I, what are we doing? So I kind of bided my time was worried about it, praying about it, trying to figure it out. And this was in October. Well, December, mid-December comes around and we have a Christmas party. And go to the Christmas party and there's award ceremonies, right? That's when all the awards come out and people are like, oh, yeah, good job, rah, rah. Well, my boss, who's vice president of construction, got the Future Thinker Award for his hard work on discovering this piece of land on Carefree Highway and I-17. And his research was paramount in the development of this. And uh, they were gonna do a semi-custom product with all these numbers that looked oh so familiar. Um, has anyone heard of the project called 
for Monto. Um, yeah. That was my idea. So, I went home from the Christmas party with probably one or two many drinks, too many, <laughs> and uh, the next day I had a, a cried and felt bad, and then I said, you know what, that's it, I'm out. So I went and worked for a small company uh, called Kenwood, Kenwood Homes. Got hired on as their vice president of construction, vice president of customer service, which sounds really super awesome. There was four of us in the office. <laughs> it just made my card look good. Uh, we did about 400 homes a year. It wasn't huge production. Uh, I had control of everything except the checkbook. And then when Trace started coming to me and saying, hey, Travis, we haven't been paid for a while. Do you know anything about this? Then we talked to the boss. Uh, the boss's name, by the way, was Charlie T. III. Oh, no. So if you know any history there. Uh, anyways, so I was on the job hunt again, and I finally landed at Del Webb. Anyone heard of Del Webb? I lost my butt, worked hard. Um, anyone heard of a project called Cordobella? I was directly responsible for that. That was my baby from you know, on site, from inception all the way through. So we built 1,400 homes in four years. Uh, we had 25 superintendents that reported to me. We had another 25 customer service reps that I was involved with. We ran production at 40 per day. We put 40 in the ground and we closed 40. 40 along the way. So I did the math one day on how many millions I was responsible for. It was something stupid like $380 million on a daily basis. So not bad for a kid that drank powdered milk as growing up. Well, this happened about 2005. We were rocking. Money's falling from the sky because, you know, everything's kicking butt. You can't go wrong. You buy a house, you're going to make money. Even before you close on the house, you've already made $100,000 in equity, right? This fake paper money is pretty awesome. Cool. Well, 2008 hits. And we go from 40 a day to two a month, two a week. Then one a month. And those 25 folks that were hired straight out of college, straight out of the military, no building experience whatsoever, had no idea how to build a home that would fit within our process. All 25 of those, I knew them. They were my friends. They knew my wife, they knew my kids, I knew their kids. I had to have those hard conversations, every one of them. We had four divorces, one suicide. And I looked at my wife and I said, sweetheart, I can never do this again. I don't know another way to train and mentor but to be involved. Because it, it's not a just do what I say, it's hey, watch see it okay your turn you do it good job okay now you're on your home let's move on to the next skill set I don't know another way to teach that's the only way that people really learn so I told her I'm like if we ever have a group again we need to have people need to have the skill sets in order to earn no matter what so the crash happens I hang out hang out um, for I, I made it to 2011 after the crash um, Kind of knew it was coming. God kind of told me it was happening. So we started about 18 months prior to that. We started a company called GGB Enterprises, and we started doing helping people who bought brand new home, brand new properties, turn it into their home. So we would do landscape packages, painting, custom media walls, change the cabinets out, counters, build a man cave, a she shed, whatever needed to happen, we did it, which was a good experience. Well, one fine Friday. My mentor came to me and said, hey, Travis, it's your turn. Here's a check, pound on the butt, good luck. And I was like, oh, finally. I can do what I've always wanted to do. I want to own my own business. So cashed in my 401k. I took a significant loan from a family member, and we started flipping. Uh, to date, I've had my hand in uh, 584 flips or wholesales. So kind of have an idea what I'm doing. So that's what I did for six years, predominantly, was flipped and wholesale. <clears throat> so the first one we bought from the bank uh, off of I-17 and Greenway, I was terrified. Uh, I thought I was gonna throw up every day because I've, I've borrowed all this money, we have all our money into it, scared to death, took a hard money loan, which by, at that point, hard money loans were 18% with 10% down. So bought this house, making these payments. We put $70,000 into a $50,000 purchase. Sold it for 220. 
So not bad, right? Did pretty good. I started joining some groups, looking for more projects, and one of my buddies calls me and says, hey, Travis, I got a deal for you. It's off uh, 12th Street and Dunlap. Great area, right? Awesome area. He's like, go check it out. I'm like, okay. So I go, how much is it? He's like, man, I'm in a spot. I need to get out of it. 20 grand. I'm like, okay, I'll go look. So I left the project I was working on. We needed another house to move on to. So I rolled over there in the truck, got the flashlight. It's dark. So I'm walking through this place. This thing was built in 1920, two story. It's, it's worth nightmares when they're done. That's, that's pretty much what it was. So I'm walking through the house. Creaking, creaking, I come into the bedroom and open the closet. A freaking homeless guy jumps out at me. And I'm like, ah, they're scaring me to death. Escort him out, get in the truck, call my friend and say, all right, I'll take it. 20 grand, I'll put the, put the contract together, let's get it going. On my drive home, another friend calls me. Travis, I need a deal. I need a deal so bad. I'm really hungry, need something to happen. My wife and the kids, we, we gotta have a deal. Well, you know, I just came across this deal. It's nice. It's off 12th Street in Dunlap. <laughs> great area. I met the neighbors. <laughs> the neighbors are great. <laughs> um, I'll tell you, because you're my friend, I'll do you a solid. I'll sell it to you for $40,000. He's like, done. So within two hours, two hours, I bought and I sold and I made $20,000. Then I thought, I've been on this flip for three months, busting my ass. My hands hurt, my back hurts, my shoulders hurt, my knees hurt. I made a little bit more than that in three months. I mean, that was maybe 50 grand in three months. However, $10,000 an hour <laughs> is a lot more lucrative than the flip. And thus, became my passion for wholesale. So that's why I love it. That's why I love it. So that turned into uh, six years ago, we got licensed as realtors. Um, my wife and I own a team here. Her name's Kirsten. She's a hot redhead. You'll see on my Facebook. Um, we coach, we mentor. We're picky about who we mentor. We want folks that really want to do this. So um, kind of, we had a team at one point of 15, and it was just, you got to want it. So changed gears and now we look for a select few. So here's my success wheel. And this isn't this isn't something I stole from Gary Keller and a few other folks that I I'm an avid reader. You have to read if you want to get better. The way I view life is this. Life is like a stool. It's a three-legged stool that you used to milk cows with. The top of it is God. I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus. That's my that's my gig. Your gig is what you want your gig to be. However, we all need to have some form of higher power in our life because that's what holds us accountable. We need a sense of right and wrong. No matter what, who you are, what you are, you just have to have that in business. The three legs that reflect off of that, there's relationships. Anybody know anybody that has a shit ton of money? How are their relationships? Mm. I know a lot of investors that have crazy money that they're they're falling out with their kids. They've been married three times. They have horrible lives. But they have a lot of money. Does that make for a good, abundant life? No. Business. Your business is here to fund your lifestyle. It has nothing to do, and guys, I'm going to talk to you for a second, it has nothing to do who we are intrinsically inside. As men, we identify very much with what we do as who we are. And that is not truth. So... Hopefully that's a nugget you can take away. Body. God gave us these bodies. Our body is designed to help us fulfill everything that we're trying to do in our life. So we need to keep it in some semblance of shape so we can execute. My goal is to leave a legacy for my kids and my grandkids. I want to, when I'm 70, to still be pitching a ball to my grandsons. So I choose to keep my body in shape. I want to go places with my hot wife. It's important. So I keep my body in shape. Keep my relationships in check. This is theory. This is how you base your everyday operation. That's why I bring it up. Does that make sense? Anybody have questions on that? No, it's, people don't talk about this stuff. This is what leads to abundance in your life. All right, entrepreneurial mindset. 
I believe, in several revenue streams. If you guys have read Martini, if you've read um, Keller, if you've read, um, gosh, any other, that guy's slip of my mind, uh, Buffett. Multiple revenue streams and make money in your sleep, right? These are the revenue streams I currently have active every day in my life. And I put an acronym there. So as a realtor, we work with people who are with the letter B. What would that be? Buyers. Buyers, right on. S. Sellers. Sellers, good job. R. Rentals. Rentals, yes, leasing, that's good. How about WS? Wholesale, that's what the class rate. Woo! Yes. F and F. Fix and flip. Good job. And C. Don't tell us. I won't. Commercial. Yes. I have all of this active in our life. You should too. Why? One will be up while the other's down. You are so smart. I'm just glad you came today. You're welcome. <laughs> the market is going to flow, right? I'm going to ask Billy to turn the heater off. It is blazing in here. Yes, hot. Good gracious. Now it's on. Can you turn that AC on? The holy bucket is off. <laughs> All right, thank you for your patience and the quick time out. So here's the deal volume is the key. As I started in real estate, I, uh, most of my relationships were with investors. And investors, eh, I don't want to talk about them. They like to make money. Even if you don't, they don't care. So my first year, I did 20 deals for a flat fee of $1,500. You mean you didn't take 3%? No, I didn't. I took $1,500. And I got open houses, and I got leads, and I generated income. Because that's what my family needed. So I want to just kind of speed this a little soapbox here right here. There's so many new agents that get this spur or burr stuck in their saddle about not getting a full 3% commission. It doesn't matter. If you're helping people and you can stack deals, who cares? It's volume. Volume is where you make money, guys. Don't get stuck on that. <clears throat> I'm not saying don't fight for your commission. But if, if it's at a spot where you can get a deal done and not get a deal done, do the deal. That's most important. Always lead with earnings. Keep a low overhead. Like I said, I don't pay for ads. I don't pay for leads. I don't pay for jack doodling because I like to make money. So hopefully you do too. Uh, grow as you earn. As you earn money, then you invest in your business. And there are certain things that I, that I do pay for. I do pay for a CRM because I don't like to send a zillion emails. Um, I pay for one that sends text messages, so it's, it's easier. I pay $40 a month which that's nothing, right? It's a lot easier than some of these newfangled berserk things that are, I did look at Infusionsoft, that was three grand a month. It was crazy ridiculous. Uh, coaching, I'm gonna say this really slowly and I'm gonna say it a couple times. Be careful who you listen to. Choosing your mentor is critical. It is the make or break of your business. Be careful who you listen to, it really matters. All right, let's get into investors. You can get hot, you little guy. All right, we have to know our audience. There's all kinds of different investors out there. Uh, my database right now has 385 cash buyers in my database. Um, they're sometimes they're full time, sometimes they're part time. The full time folks and these men and women, um, they're super aggressive, they're fast paced, they have they're super intensive. Uh, intense, their numbers are what matter. They're going to talk about cap rates. They're going to talk about uh, percentages. That, that's how they discuss. So you need to have your mind ready to go in those conversations. Who can tell me what a cap rate is? Cap rate is uh, when you, um, how many million that you from the investment? Rate of capitalization. Yes, sir. How do we figure a cap rate? Man, it's been a little while since real estate school. I know, I'm hitting you guys here. Expenses, rising time. So it's the total investment, right? How much the property costs, plus all the expenses, plus taxes, plus carry, plus water, sewer, whatever. Take all that, divide it by 12, and then look at what your monthly income is, divide the monthly income by that, it generates your cap rate. Right? 
cap rate, if you're talking with an investor on a multi-unit dwelling, if they're making 12%, would they be happy? Oh, heck yeah, they're going to be happy. Yeah. Uh, with an investor on a single family home, if they're making 10%, are they going to be happy? Oh yeah, heck yeah, they're going to be happy. So having an understanding of those cap rates will help you in conversation. So it's, and I'll show you about marketing here in a second. Key indicators with these guys, they have margin standards, several exit strategies, they're fast at making decisions, and they have contracted labor. You're not going to see these guys with a hammer and tool bag with these ladies. Uh, one of the people that buy from me regularly, you, she is stunning, she's beautiful, she is so smart, she makes decisions right then. I'll call her and say, hey, I got this one, do you want it? Within three minutes, she makes her decision. So she's very sharp, she makes a ton of money. Okay, here's our part-timers. Little handy handy guys, ladies. They're part-timers, they're more patient, they're super scared out of their mind because they're taking little Johnny's college fund and betting it all on red. Working with you, right? That's how it kind of feels. So understand their situation. They have a lot of questions. They're gonna rely on you for all of the research. Key indicators of part-time investors, they have limited exit strategies. We need to make this work because we can't take on a rental because this hard money is killing us. If we don't sell this soon, we can't eat. Those are conversations that are real and that I've had. Concerned about specific dollar amounts. Travis, are we gonna make at least 10 grand on this? Are we gonna make at least $7,000? Are we gonna make $30,000? They don't know percentages. They don't understand that. It takes longer to evaluate deals. Days, sometimes, it takes a long time. You gotta be patient. And they have do-it-yourself labor. Their cousin Manny does electrician and he worked at a car wash and at one point he did HVAC a little bit, kinda, so we're gonna give him a shot. Like, and he's gonna do it for beer and pizza. We're all gonna have a party. We're gonna paint. Those, those are deal with DIY part-time folks. Stories are funny. So when you're marketing your wholesale property, you have to understand that you need to market to both of these folks, the full-time folks and the part-timers. My father-in-law has an amazing saying. Uh, we go to his house, my mother-in-law's house, every Sunday for, for afternoon dinner. He says, there's 13, or there are seven grandchildren, there's 13 of us all together. So he says the baby and the old person should be able to eat from the same table and have nourishment from the same meal. Same concept when working with part-timers and full-time investors. Everybody should get nourishment out of your marketing team. You need to understand their needs. Know the ROI, cap rate, market area. Text. I send text to my investors. Always. I get a 90% open rate. I follow it with an email that gets a 10% open rate. Which is why I text. To tell them to go to their email. Here's an example text. This is a live deal we did. That we closed this one in October. 761 East Denham Trail. Zip code 2,600 square foot, five bedroom, two and a half bath with loft, 2006 build, needs a cosmetic rehab. Here's the bit.ly pictures. Uh, I go to a Dropbox, I put all the pictures of the Dropbox, copy that link, go to bit.ly, get a smaller URL and put it in the text. Wholesale price, 190. The estimated rehab, this is very important. Everybody's rehab, everybody's numbers are different. My numbers are different than your numbers, different than Joe's numbers, different than Mary's numbers. This is my estimate. Estimated ARV, we should all be able to get that. That's pulling comps. What's ARV stand for? Accurate Good job. Yes. All right, that's the text I sent out. Here's the email. I do little happy houses in the headlines and try to be intention getting. 761 East Denham Trail, Santan Valley, a little bit more information. Spelled out words, 2667 square feet, five bedroom, two bath with a loft, built in 2006, a little more information. There's a community pool, 5200 square foot lot. Now I tell what they need. It's our job to cast the vision. Investors can't talk and see it. They need a cosmetic rehab, carpet, Paint, landscape cleanups, floors and tops. Close of escrow, give them a little more information, 831. 
Wholesale price right now, 190. Estimated rehab, 15K. Estimated ARV, 265. Here's the long winded drop box. Critical, this last paragraph. First contract in $5,000 earnest money deposited to title or per property to title wins. Calling for access, verify, buyer to verify all facts and figures. Buyer pays all closing costs. Ask me about the 100% property and rehab financing. The most important line in this is the first contract from 5K. The reason why is as you develop relationships and you get rolling, you're gonna get, hey, I'm gonna I'm give you the contract and I'll, I'll get that 5K as well, I'll just hold on the house and then I'm done. Well, this guy wants it too. Well, no, we're friends. Just, just hold on the house with me. You start doing that type of stuff and you burn relationships. So from the inside, inset, onset, right word, I have said, it's a race to title, guys. Whoever gets a check there, the signed contract first, you win. That's always how it works. That way, I don't hurt anybody's feelings because people are sensitive and they people are hurt, right? We don't want that. Right. Does your COE re refer to when you're you're closing on it? Mm -hmm. That's when they would be closing too. Yes. It's a great question. Do you have your own contract? We're in a corporate contract today, okay. and you can take as many pictures as you want. Also, do you have to put the brokerage on that video? Um, I cut off oh. my signature line. So the signature line is the same one I get from Colby, and yeah. I had them make me so one. I was told by another wholesaler that we could like forward it off, or because like, I don't have a big list like you, right? So I get on small list and mm -hmm. all that. And, you know, so I forward it off, and then I just changed the wholesale price up top down. Is that normal? We're gonna talk about that in a few minutes, oh. but yes, mm -hmm. thank you for that segue. Yes, and that that's perfect. You're doing a great job. All right. Did anybody else have any questions on that before I move on? All right, so to your point, developing an investor database. This is gonna be very similar to having your real estate database. You're now just creating another silo. And guess what? It's another business and you have to treat it as such. It's not just I do real estate and I'm muddy in the water all the way around. I have investors. I take care of my investors. This is a whole different breed than mom and dad's best friend Sally and Harry that want to go buy a house next weekend. Totally different concept, right? Different marketing, different hat, different mindset. So you have to treat it as such. Relationships really matter. Demonstrate a heart of contribution. And this is across the board. I am here to help. You will hear me say that often. Whether I'm working with an investor or working with a buyer, seller, commercial, fix and flip partner, joint venture, I'm here to help. That's my heart. I want you to be successful. If they're successful, you're successful, right? Okay. Advertise on social media. Hey, anybody looking to buy cash deal wholesales? Any investors out there? You guys have seen it. Who's my investors out there? Start capturing information and building an investor database. Go to Asria meetings, Facebook groups. There's so many investors out there going, hey, Send me a deal. So many of them. And will you probably overlap with some of mine? Yeah. Will you overlap with some of mine? Because yeah, it's okay. It's all right. There's enough business for us all out here. As you succeed in the small stuff, you'll become more and more successful. So let's define a wholesale property. What is a wholesale property? This is Travis's dictionary. My definition, it's an undervalued property in an area of appreciation. I don't want to buy the biggest house in the neighborhood. I want to buy a medium house. So it can appreciate and catch the price point of the biggest house. Now we're going to talk about values. Of all the things that we're going to talk about today, this is what trips people up. So please ask questions. I want to make sure everyone understands this. Okay. Let's talk about market value. What is market value? Someone will pay. What someone will pay and? Well, correct. Both parties have to agree, right? This is market value. I like to use my mom's house as an example. My mom bought a house in 1988. It has that righteous pink oak cabinets. You know what I'm talking about? And not only does she have pink oak cabinets, she has mauve curtains. 
And then one weekend, her and her best friend got together and they had this awesome vault and they sponge painted mauve with a glaze of silver. And not only did they do that, they put pink carpet in it. So market value on mom's house may be a little bit different than the one that has just been completely rehabbed, that has planked floors, the barn doors, the cascading courts. Could be different, right? All right, just put that in your mind. We're gonna talk about that some more. Appraised value, what's appraised value? I do have the answers on the board, but. <laughs> it's what a lender's gonna lend, right? That's appraised value. Why is that important to us? important to our investors because it brings value, right? All right, wholesale value is somewhere between 70 and 80% of market value. Wholesale value is somewhere between 70 and 80% of market value. So when I get calls, I get calls, people call me all the time, Travis, I got a deal, it's an awesome deal. I'm like, okay, tell me about it. Well, it's over in Arrowhead, I mean, it's awesome. It's on the MLS, and I got them to come down $10,000 off the MLS price. Do you think we can sell it? No, mm -hmm. I don't think we can sell it. We have to create value, and that value is in the spread. So let's go back to mom's house as an example. Okay, mom's house is on 87th Avenue in Union Hills. Nice area? Nice area. 1,500 square feet, or 1,200 square feet, sorry. Prices right now in that area is any anybody west side? How many? It's about 220, 225, and that would be average house that's had some updates. If you had a kick-ass remodel, it's more like 245, 250. So let's price mom's house. We know we need to do what? Flooring. We know what? What else? Paint. Cabinets. 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 Countertops. Countertops. Think the roof's in good shape? Maybe. Let's look at that. Yeah. Okay, so it's on now. Chances Does are that make a difference? Like, let's just say there was a new roof and a new AC and copper plumbing, but they went and updated it to 1070. That's a big difference, yeah. So would we be going, you know, closer to 80 <clears throat> as, as you know, yep. opposed to 70? If we don't have to go in and do, and all of this is going to be different. So we'll use a mom's example as a house that was built in 1988. We also buy houses that were built in 1940. That we understand there's galby pipe that we have to not only get out of the walls, but we have to saw cut the floor, take the galby pipe out, get to the clay sewer tap, rerun the sewer tap. So we're understanding where there's 20 grand in plumbing rehab right there. So it just depends on the house, but we're kind of using this as a baseline. If market value for a halfway redone house is two and a quarter, and mom's house needs X amount of dollars worth of rehab, let's say 20 grand in rehab, would, would our wholesale price be $200,000? There's no room, right? No. Where would our wholesale price need to be? Yes. Yes. Do you understand how we got there? Market value on mom's house is two hundred thousand dollars, right? What is seventy to eighty percent of two hundred grand? Does this make sense? Okay. This is what hangs people up. So you said the offer would be how much? 140 70. is 70% of 200. Yeah, so 140 to 160, yeah, 70 to 80%. Cool, so we get it at 70 to 80% because then we're gonna turn around and sell it to an investor and mark up the middle. That's where we make our money. If we can't get it at that 70 to 80%, we're not bringing value to the investor. We are looking for a win, win, win. A win for mom, because she's selling her house and doesn't have to deal with showings. She's not dealing with open door and gonna get hammered by them in the inspection process and all the open door crap and the offer path and other stuff. 
win for us in the middle so we can make some money and a win for the investor because they need to make money. Everybody makes money. Cool? Okay, so you kind of talk to you like that and it's going to happen. in our skill set as a realtor, with our realtor hat, mm -hmm. I take my computer with me. I show them, hey, here's comps. Mm -hmm. This is what a remodeled house looks like. Does yours look like that? Mm -hmm. And they do it. Mm -hmm. And Anthony, you were a buyer. Which one were you buying? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. I also do value analytics. This is my, uh, I call it house cost sheet. I'm an Excel freak. I love Excel. And just because you come today, you are a lucky winner of this. I will send this to you if you will do me the kindness of signing in legibly so I can read your phone number and email and name and so I call you by name, that type of thing. I will walk through this with you. This is awesomeness. I love this. Sounds like a <laughs> performer or debt. Yeah, you could call it performer. You want to be you know, fancy with your well, investor? If like it's not that, you can tell me that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. All right, so the way I figure this is this. So our purchase price, we're still our mom's house. We're, we're going to bump the, we're going to call it $200,000 is going to be our purchase price. That's what we're capturing at. Hard money loan. And by the way, these are my numbers. The numbers that I work with on a day-in, day in basis, day-out basis. If the deal doesn't make sense to me, it's not going to make sense to the investors. I won't even sell there's so many things I don't send out that are not deals. So you, this is gonna be your stop go. Hard money loan is $160,000. How much money are we putting down percentage wise on this? 20. 20, 20. good job, we're putting 20% down, good. Uh, hard money down payment is $40,000. Interest on the hard money, 10% and I'm carrying it for Four months. That's my plan. Why would I do that? Mm -hmm. There's a time frame between fifteen and seven. I'm, I'm baking in the carry carry time, right? So why would I carry four months? Why would I plan on that? Because you need to flip it yourself. Yeah. Why is the investor going to be concerned if we have a four month carry? Why would four months be important? Not under pressure. Look at the price point. Because you're probably not going to be able to get any other pre-bought buyers for the first five years. Good. Yes. Oh, yeah. yes. Wonderful. So when you go on the market, because you just purchased this house and they rehabbed it, especially if they're a full-time investor, they'll get the rehab done in two weeks. From the time they buy it, demo it, gut it, put on the new stuff, and back on the market, 15 days. Done. So. We need to have that time baked in. They'll go on the market immediately and say conventional and cash only. At the 90 day mark, then we open up to the FHA. Yes? Hard money down payment. Why is it a hard money down payment and not cash down payment? Why, why does it have hard money in front of it? Um, that's the cash that you're having to put down to capture the hard money. But it's your cash? Yes. Okay. Yes. So. The carry is going to be $5,300. That's what we're budgeting and being aware of. Closing costs, $1,500. We have good relationships at several different title companies. So that's about right. Remodel, we're budgeting for $30,000. Insurance, I'm going to soapbox for a second. I have a couple knuckleheads in our investor group that refuse to put insurance on their properties. One is a dude in his 50s. One is a dude in his 20s early 20s. The one in his early 20s, he's dumb, he's young. We can all agree on that. <laughs> the dude in the 50s is like, oh my gosh, you're risking your marriage, your house, your life, your business, because your dumbass won't put insurance on the house. End of soapbox. Please encourage the folks that you're working with to put insurance on their house. APS and water, 700 bucks. Total cash invest. So 
they're in $78,000 cash. That's cash money that they need to do this flip. Front side costs, including the hard money loan, almost 240 grand. Does everybody understand this? Does this make sense? On the insurance, mm -hmm. do you So in the master class, I talk about insurance companies and other relationships that we have. You want to have an LLC and why? This is one of the reasons you buy business insurance because this is an asset. It's not a personal home. Insurance rates are totally different and they cover against terrorist attacks and against changes in the market. There's against theft, like all kinds of crazy stuff you have coverage for that you want a normal home. It's a great question. Great question. All right, so now we're going to the back side. Estimated, or ARV, estimated renovated sales price, $300,000. Real estate commission, 5%. Why in God's green earth would it be 5%? Because it's one side. Same representation. Yeah. Relationship with the listing agent. A relationship with the investor. The investor. The investor. Yes. I automatically, without question, every time, if someone buys from me, hey man, I really appreciate you buying from me. Thank you for being willing to take on this wholesale and this project. As a thank you, I'm going to discount my listing fee to 5% so that you can put more money in your pocket. What did I just do? What else did I just do? Repeat business. What else did I just do? Turn one deal into That's fun, right? Yay! And now I have a place for our team to do open houses and get more deals. Now I have a place where I can talk with, oh wow, look at this remodel. This place looked like a pounded piece of dog food before. Remember? You're in the neighborhood. This is what we do. So the only one that wants to make money is these guys are gonna make about 57%. You know anybody else that wants to make money? Oh no, I have nobody that likes to make money. <laughs> cool, right? All right, so real estate commission, 15 grand, title fees. Roughly, it's if you do a hold open policy, it's $3,000 for uh, the purchase and the sell. So I just split it up in the two. Uh, total fees, $16.50 minus the front side from the back side is $45,000 in profit or 57% ROI. Think anybody do that? Yeah. Most of our investors are thrilled if you're catching 30 to 33%. Okay. Questions on this? You think about it. Oh. That's it. I mean, obviously, you got a two hundred thousand dollar buy, a three hundred thousand dollar sale. So you're at you know, the earlier slide was seventy, eighty percent. This is more like sixty seven percent, give mm -hmm. or take. How how often are you seeing deals with that kind of a spread, or the opportunity on the buy side to get that kind of a spread? Is it? I get deals every day. Um, most of the time, because and we're going to talk about this here in a few minutes. There's a zillion wholesalers out there, and wholesalers are not held to the same code of ethics as we are, right? So we do business honestly, and I would encourage you to do the same thing. If the spread's not there, don't make it sound like it is. Most of the wholesale stuff I get emails from, it's all crap. They're like, oh, buy this deal at 100,000, put 20 bucks into it, and you will make five million. Like, it's a lot of extreme like that. You know, hundred thousand dollar ballpark hit. You can totally do it. Be honest. Do I see deals like this? Yeah, I do. Are they fewer and far between than they used to be? Yes. Most of our investors are capitalizing on volume. The more that they can spend, the more that they'll make. I'm still seeing some pretty big watersheds out. Do you do you usually? I mean, all investors are going to have different criteria for what they want to make. I mean, there's not a lot of people going to walk away from a fifty-seven percent return. 
where, where do you see like the low end of willingness to invest in, in take the risk? 30. Or depend, I see 30, or if it's a, if that 30% has a big balance, then it's gotta make sense. Sure. So if they're investing 750,000 and they're gonna make it 1.2, that 30% is a good that, number. That number sure. changes. So right. some, you can, sometimes you can push it down to like 18% people are still willing to do. Do you have a question, Mark? Okay. How did you use this document if you're not involved in the remodel and the pitch? I mean, you're just, if you're wholesaling, do you do this for them and show them, even though they may have different contractors and different numbers? You're just saying, here's what's possible. Hmm. I take a snapshot of this. So it's also underneath the email that you would see that I sent. But otherwise, the email would have been just swapped. <laughs> I'll put this on there and attach it as a picture. Esti always estimated budget, estimated, estimated, because their numbers are different than ours, and you don't ever want to keep a set. You don't want that, you know. Okay, any other questions on, yes? So the first one might be, but I don't know anything about construction. How would we get a budget to find out what the remodeling cost would be? That's why we have the come from <laughs> <laughs> help an immunology if you need help with this what I need is pictures send me pictures it sounds like a guy got a deal we're going to talk a little bit more about how I work with our partners at my home group and other brokerages here in a few minutes all right value to the investor okay wholesale is coming all different sizes shapes all kinds of different things the craziest deal I've ever sold was a 13 unit multifamily off of north of I-17, where it goes around the Durango Curve, it's on 4th Street. Um, a buddy of mine sold it to me for 200,000. I sold it for two, 220. They remodeled it, we sold it for three something, and I got a commission in a wholesale on it. So this place had four studios, four one bedroom, one baths, and four, shit you know, camper trailers, hooked up to the sewer and gas on two parcels. It was a little micro community. They collected rent and cash, always. We had, if you kept Dr. Pepper in the vending machine, you made a killing, probably made four or $500 just on Dr. Pepper a month. <laughs> and we also had a laundry facility. The place was nuts, but it was a cash cow. Made a killing. So I tell those stories because anything is possible. It's not just single family. I've done duplexes, triplexes. It doesn't matter. If the money's there, investors will buy. There's not one size that fits all. Investors have their own preferences, formulas, fits, areas, specific desired features, stigmas, rituals, superstitions, and feelings. Okay, the reason I bring this up, one of my buddies, Rob, I did about 200 deals with this guy. He is a Saskatchewan Bigfoot out of Washington, hippie. He wears <laughs> shorty shorts, ball cap with his hair hanging out scraggly, cusses like a sailor. He's insane. If he does not have his special socks that day, he's not buying. So I got in the habit of carrying an extra pair of socks. Like, dude, I got your socks. Let's buy the socks. This makes sense. <laughs> All right, they're like ball players. They're weird. Um, <laughs> oh, cool! Right on. Thanks, <laughs> Peter. <laughs> Am I right? Yeah, there's some there's some crazy people out there. Um, so one of our other guys, all he buys is corner lots with a pool. That's it. That's it. It's got to be a corner lot with a pool. If it's not that, I don't want it. Um, they have all kinds of weird ticks. Some people only want an Arcadia Lake. Others only want in North Phoenix. Everybody has their little wheelhouse where they think they're gonna make money. It's their business. Our job is to say, that's great. That's awesome. I'm really happy for you that you like this little area. What I have to offer is this. They can tell me till they're blue in the face that I'm going in this area. Hey, this is what I got today. What do you think? Let's talk about it. Look at the spread. I know it's a little bit outside your area. However, the money and the numbers make sense. What do you think? Okay. They'll move, you just have to be creative. So be prepared for that, because they come up with weird crap. They're strange. 
identify wholesale properties. What others have available? You helped me with this a few minutes ago. Thank you for bringing that up. Now that you're part of our group, as I send wholesales out, you will see it. Take my marketing. Oh, I gave you permission to rebrand. Take my piece. Rebrand it with your own stuff. Mark it up. Just hear me. Mark it up. I learned this lesson the hard way one time. I did a deal for free. My wife was pissed. It wasn't good. So she come to me and said, Travis, oh my gosh. I totally forgot to mark it up. I just sent it out at your price. Can I get a little, can I get a little you know, on the side? No. Here's my answer right now. No. You will learn your lesson. You'll never do it again. You'll thank me later. You'll thank me later. Plus, it's, it's bad form. You don't want to come back to people like that, right? You want good relationships. You don't want to be that bad person. Um, okay, cool. I did everything. I didn't have to look on the side. Okay. Identifying wholesale properties yourself. This is the watershed. This is where you make the big killings. I've made $30,000 twice on people from in my database that had properties that needed to wholesale. Um, you can find them yourself. They're within your database. You can go on Craigslist, classifieds. Um, the two, I'll tell you one of the stories. Get close on time, so. Um, a buddy of mine from college really one of my best friends, calls me up. Says, hey Travis, you remember that house that you built while on 91st Avenue in Deer Valley, Dub Valley, later Dub Valley? Built the house from Standard Pacific for him. He bought it when we were kids. Uh, he says, remember that house? I'm like, oh yeah, I didn't know you still had it. Oh yeah, we've had a renter in there for eight years. Uh, I got an HOA letter that there's a smell and some cats. So I don't know what to do, will you go with me? I'm like, yeah, I give him 48 hours notice. I'll, be, I'll go with you. The smell hit us from the curb. Um, it, it's 2,200 square foot, two bedroom, or four bedroom, two bath, two and a half bath. Beautiful, beautiful home. Was, was. As we walk in, there are pathways through the house and mounds of stuff. Um, on contract, there was two people that were supposed to live there. We observed eight including a baby that was running around in a diaper that had been full for a long time. Oh. It was leaking debris, not moisture, debris. Oh. Um, there was no carpet left in the house, and dogs and humans were not required to use any type of facility. <coughs> you just did your thing where you went. Um, there were 18 cats and four dogs also involved in this property. Smell was something I've never encountered before. Never. So we walk out front, and my buddy just breaks down. He's like, Travis, I can't tell my wife about this. I just, this is the house we fell in love with. We got married here, we got pregnant here. She can't tell. Like, okay, how do you want me to help you? He's like, just, I owe 130 on this. Anything that you can get above that, We'll split. Deal. Oh. Huh? So I call up one of my buddies who needs property. Travis, I need a property. I need a property. He's like, all right, dude, I got this awesome property for you. <laughs> it smells bad, which means you're going to make money. Like, oh, okay. What's the deal? Uh, I'll sell it to you for one ninety. Done. Bought it the next day. Oh my word. Who is so rude to leave their phone on in the middle of the class? So sorry, guys. Um, anyways, so he buys, he buys the property and totally guts it. He bought it for 190. He put in 50. Sold it for 340. Did he make money? Mm -hmm. Is my friend's marriage safe? Mm -hmm. Did I make money? Yeah. Everybody's happy. Yeah. Worked out pretty good. He didn't have the financial resources, my friend, to take on that project. Could it sell him MLS? People are trying to sell that crap on MLS right now. You'll see it, it's out there. That was one of our big hits. Made 30 grand on that deal. That was nice. And not only that, but I also represented this. So truthfully, I got another 2% of the 327. So that's a, what, 40, almost $40,000. That's a good day, right? Okay, so it's possible. I wasn't kidding. 
thousand, three thousand, ten thousand. It's possible. All right, where else do I find sellers? I find them on Craigslist, classifieds, the MLS, anything that's 180 days or more, database, social media. Hey, we buy houses. Have any of you stalked me on social media? Anybody look at look me up? No. Okay. If you look through my social media, you're going to see projects and me talking about projects and what we're doing. That generates traction within my groups, within my own database. I get people call me all the time, Travis, I have a problem. Can you help me? Yeah, of course I can help you. They know my heart from watching my stuff on a regular basis. I'm here to help. Can you guys tell that even just from our conversation so far? That's truly who I am. I want to help. Do I make a living off this? Yeah. We all have to pay our bills, right? I get to make a living doing something I love, I'm passionate about. I love helping other people. All right. Don't forget to mark it up. All right. Let's talk about the offer process. How does this work? Feel free to take pictures if you need to. So I find a lead on Craigslist and I give him a call. Hey, I see you've got a property sale to sell. Yeah, I do. Look, 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 I hear a bark, dog bark. Hey, you got a dog? Yeah, I got a dog. Oh man, I got three dogs too. Tell me about your dog. People love to talk about their dogs. Mm -hmm. You're a current baby. Oh, I hear you have a baby. Yeah, I got a baby. Oh, I got three kids too. They're grown. Oh my gosh, I missed it when they were this age. What are they doing? Oh, they're four months old. Oh, they're starting to roll over and starting to probably get up and Right? They know that I'm paying attention. Do I care? Yes. That's why I ask the questions. Establish a relationship. <coughs> then we're going to work on <coughs> discovery. How, what, why, when, where, how much? What's going on with the property? I see that you have listed here on <coughs> Zillow because you're for sale by owner. We call those people too, right? Mm -hmm. That this house says it's a four bedroom five bath. Is that right? Oh, no, man, I messed up on Zillow. It's a four bedroom, two and a half bath. Oh, okay. Tell me a little more. What, have you done any updates? I can kind of see in the pictures, this looks like that. Is that real? No, that's kind of, I got no idea. It would really be helpful if I could come by. Are you available tomorrow between one and three? What do I do? Easy. I started getting some yeses, and I moved to schedule the appointment. Always have to go view the property. Always. All right, visit. Before you go to the property, you have to do your homework. That's why God made Monsoon, and that's why God made Maricopa County Assessment. We want to check and make sure that the square footage is what they think the square footage is. We want to, that also tends, if you have an idea, if you go on Maricopa County Assessor, there, on the bottom of the page, it will say building sketches. You can click on that and you can have a footprint of what it's supposed to look like. When you get into Maryville and some other areas, <laughs> that, mean, that footprint looks nothing like what's on the lot. There's all kinds of homeowner specials that happen. So I have a way around that. Don't be afraid of it. It's okay. There's additions that are not permitted. I don't care. We can get around it. Don't stress. But know it. We have to know it's there. Uh, Reestablish your relationship. Knock on the door. Hey, Valerie. Yes, it's Travis. I'm the guy. We talked about the dog. Yeah, we talked about the kid. Ha ha. Yay, yay. Cool. I'm here on time. Our appointment's at 1 o'clock. I am here. May I come in? Yes. Cool. I have my backpack with me. Hey, is it okay if I set my backpack down here and we take you on a tour? Yes. Yes. Awesome. We'll walk around the house, look at stuff. I'm gonna take some notes, take some pictures. What do I take pictures of, guys? Your repairs. Repairs? Yes. I'm gonna take repairs, pictures of repairs, pictures of the kitchen, pictures of the front, pictures of the back, pictures of the bedrooms, pictures of the bathrooms. Anything that looks funky, double picture time. If like something smells, what is it? Why am I smelling? Find it, take a picture of it. We we'll wanna know. Because I want, when, as I walk through, I'm looking at these things. I'm trying to establish what's happening. Because they have a dollar figure in their mind, right? What they want. We're trying to get to what's reality. Just like any listing appointment you go on, right? <coughs> Excuse me. 
set the tone. I work with the team, and I want to present your property for as a potential purchase. I really want to help you. Do you notice the inflection of my words? I want to help you. Jamie, I'm giving some bonus material here. It's a little human psychology, a little communication skill. This stuff matters. These little things matter. I will bring you a cash offer. <coughs> All right. <coughs> Excuse me, I have throat tickle. All right, so now, of course, Zillow, this estimate says it's worth, right? Mm -hmm. So these folks have a, this is what we think we need. You have no idea that when it rains and there's a fountain in your living room, that actually reduces the price of your house. You know, that's, that's happened. I've been on that plane. Or... But that Frankenstein looking AC that you have, that reduces the price of your house. So we have to talk through those things. Um, a real easy segue into this conversation is, hey, when I was at your house, your, your property, on this visit, I noticed X, Y, Z things need to be done. The fountain, the AC, uh, the sinkhole, the plumbing leak, whatever. Uh, every house has something. I noticed this. What do you think a contractor would charge to fix this? And just shut up. Let them stew. They have no idea. They're not going to know. When you see them get uncomfortable, let the minute sit. And say, hey, I know you don't understand. No, I do. I work with a team of experts. We have a concept of what this is going to cost. The reason I bring it up is we have to fix this. You don't want to fix it, and we're trying to give you an out, an easy way to just leave as is, take what you want, we'll take care of the rest. Whatever. It's okay. But we have to deal with this, so there has to be some way to help us get that done. That's where we get our price drop. Does that make sense? Am I being a jerk? Am I telling the truth? But have you done a formal inspection, or you just because you know what you know, you've done the inspection? When you call me and say, hey, Travis, I went and saw this house, I just drop boxed you a bunch of pictures. Can you take a minute to look at it? Bet. This is what I'm seeing. Blah, 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 blah. This is basic cost. Blah, 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 blah. Here's what you should look for. Uh -huh. yeah. Do the nature of repairs needed on your property, we need X amount of dollars available to take care of ABC. Get on the market. Make the offer. Hey, remember me. I'm Travis. I'm the guy that we talked about all this stuff. Puppies, dogs, kids. We're friends, remember? Yeah, yeah. I'm here to help you. Remember? Yes. You notice how I ask questions that are naturally going to have a yes answer. I want them to get used to saying yes to me. Is that manipulative? Kind of a little bit. Is it human psychological? Yeah, it is. But my heart is genuine that I want to help this person. Present the offer over the phone. Um, it's better if you can do it in person. But never, ever, ever, never, ever just email them and say, here's your offer. That relationship matters so much, guys. I have had sellers go with me even though they were getting five grand more offered by someone else. Most investors, when they go into a situation like this, they're jerks. They pull up in their Mercedes, show off their bling, cufflinks, show up all pimped out, and act a fool. That's how most folks do this. If you go in there with a genuine attitude that you're here to help them, there's a reason they're selling that house. They don't have the money to fix AC. They don't have the money to fix the home. They're going through a divorce. Their kid's in the hospital. They need the money out of this sale so that they can get by. There's a reason why. We have to have a heart, guys. It's really important. Our offer is cash, as is, and we do a two-week escrow. That's a standard. If this person's like, hey, I need a month, no problem. Hey, I want to close in two days, no problem. We can do it. The price is right, we can do it. Real deal. Writing the contract. We, I use standard AAR forms. 
I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit because I only have 15 minutes left and I don't want to keep you over without asking you first. Um, we should know these really, really well, especially since we're all licensed agents. What to include? Your purchase contract, as is, you don't need that anymore. Market conditions, HOA if needed, wastewater and well if needed. Um, be prepared with your pre-qual or proof of funds. The wonderful part of knowing me is I'm pre-qualified for the moon. I can buy anything I want. I have fantastic relationships with hard money investors. Literally, I can write my own pre-qual forms. So if you need help with that, we can talk. Um, this is what goes in section eight. I'm gonna preface this with, please make sure you have a conversation with Mark or Jeremy or Mary and just say, hey, I'm getting into wholesaling. I'm working with Travis, just wanted to give you a heads up, okay? Or whatever brokerage you're at, just have that conversation. This is what we put. Buyer retains rights of double escrow and seller acknowledges the buyer's intent to close this transaction as an assignment or double escrow. Buyer and seller are aware that this transaction is for the intended profit of both parties. Buyer and seller agree to extend the close of escrow as needed to identify and cure any additional turn items that may prevent the seller from providing the buyer free and clear title. <coughs> All of this is massively important. We have to disclose that this is the intended profit for us. If we say it this way, it's nice because we want them to make money too, right? All the way you say it. Next, <coughs> this paragraph. This saved my butt on a, on a deal that we did in April. It took until I finally got paid in October. It was a three thousand dollar deal. It wasn't a huge deal, but because I had this in the contract that they were extend escrow to get provide free and clear title, it was a probate deal. Went into a trust. The lawyers fought for six months. Finally got who, who was supposed to be signing the contract on the contract and we closed. If I didn't have that there, I'd have been out running and selling one of my business partners. Oh, sorry. Okay. Question if I have to Close of escrow shall be honored before X date. Awesome to put that in there because then you have freedom within the contract. One or more members of GGB Enterprises LLC is a licensed realtor. You have to disclose that you're a licensed realtor. Buyer agrees to pay all closing costs. Stop, time out. This is in my standard form. I approach sellers with, hey, this is fair. I'm going to pay my closing costs. You're going to pay your closing costs. It comes out of the proceeds of the house. I don't volunteer that automatically. If we get to some type of dining point on negotiating the deal, I'll say, all right, dude. I'll pay your closing cost, but I want it for $3,000 less. It's all how you word it. If it's what's important to them. Sometimes the closing costs are a big deal. Sometimes price point's a big deal. Sometimes net's a big deal. Just got to figure out what's important to them. By the way, there's appraisal contingency and accept a property is as is where is condition. I always have this in here. Even though it says it in the contract, I show it to them in the additional terms. Because I tell them verbatim, Take what you want, leave what you don't, and I'll take care of it. I've had one house that was 1,200 square feet, and we had three 40-yard roll-offs of crap that was in that house. And we incurred the cost because it was a good deal. And we helped them because they, they were overwhelmed by just the amount of crap in their house. Hoarders. Buyer is not represented. Seller is not represented. When I'm doing wholesales, I am not I'm representing myself as owner of GGB Enterprises. I'm licensed, I use standard AR forms. There's no representation on the buyer or the seller. It's just a contract between the buyer and seller. Does that make sense? Are you supposed to not use the AR forms if you, leave, if you omit the broker from the section on the signatory page? That's up to your broker. How about the association on the use of the form? Okay. That's why I'm saying please talk with the, the guys to make sure everything's okay with this. All right. But do you write? <laughs> 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 yes. 
Yes. No, I had, when I came aboard, I had But you're just in the title of the show. I just took the time. Okay, so they don't even know that it's out there. When I came on board here, I was very poignant and said my business is half 50-50 wholesale. Much as this is my conversation with a broker. So we have an agreement. You would need to have some type of conversation with your broker to come to some arrangement. If you want to get straight paid straight from title. I don't know. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. Alright, back to where we were. Then the contract. Alright, before you start marketing this property, you must be under contract. Don't tell anybody that you have a wholesale. This is huge. I'll tell you a small story. We had an office on 75th and Bell, or 75th and Union Hills. One of our new agents came in, all excited. She just got her first wholesale deal. Thrilled. Talking it up. Yay, yay, yay. I'm going to head over there in a couple hours to get it inked. Travis, you know anybody? Oh, there's other people here. She didn't listen. Another lady, veteran agent, came in, sat down. I just found a wholesale. Started talking it up. Oh, really? I have investors. What's the address? Blah, 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 East Evans. Oh, no. Really? What, what price did you get it at? Oh, I got a great deal. I got it at and told her, wow, man, I probably have a buyer for that. That's so cool. Thank you for telling me. Packed up her computer, got her car, drove over to blah 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 East Evans, knocked on the door. Hey, I heard that you just sold your house to such oh, and yeah. such agent. Yeah, we're gonna sign the deal today. Wow, she's been doing this here lately. She's been going out and doing these things. She's a brand new agent. She's not really sure what she's doing. Would it be okay if I came out? Here's a contract. I'll pay you three thousand dollars more than what she was offering. Just sign right here. Make sure you're under contract before you open your gapper. We as realtors have a tendency to over talk. Don't. Um, you can also file an affidavit of equitable interest at Maricopa County. This basically puts a small cloud on the title that says if the buyer or if the seller gets nuts and starts writing contracts with everybody, you're the one that has equitable interest. Ask me if I do this. No, I don't. But I'm going to teach you right away. I've never done that. Um, don't share with others until you have it under contract. Please, for the love of God, know that's important. Don't tell people until you have it under contract. If you call me and say, hey, I need this, I'll help you. Okay? I won't do this because I value the relationship. Other people are not honest. So watch out for that. Marketing. Share it on Facebook, Pinterest, Google+, Plus, email, blast it to your database. Uh, we can help with this as well. I, this is a little dated. I have 385 cash buyers that are hungry and want a deal right now. All the time. I also have access to over 24,000 if we need it. So if it's a deal, let's sell. Exit strategies. Assignment. Double escrow, free and flip, joint venture, rental, rental home program. Assignment versus double escrow. My rule of thumb is this. If I'm making more than $5,000 on a deal, I will always do a double escrow. If I'm making under $5,000 on a deal, I'll consider doing an assignment. Uh, assignment, basically, your contract that you have, the buyer or investor takes your space and you get paid an assignment fee. Comes from title, you get paid directly. The caveat to this is they see your contract. They understand everything involved in that contract. They're taking it over. So, I've had one knucklehead in, <laughs> that tried to do an assignment that showed over $100,000 in equity going to him in this assignment. As an investor, what would you say? No. 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 Yes. Yeah. What are you doing? Even though the, it was still a deal. It was still a deal with that guy making 100 grand. But because he was dumb and didn't do a double escrow and keep his information private and wanted to save $1,200. <laughs> Eventually the investor's gonna know what that sale was anyway. After. Out of 500 plus deals, I've had one investor go back and say, Travis, 
you got it for 12 grand. Dude, did you like the deal? Yeah. Did you make 30, 40? Yeah, but I could have made more because you just took one. Like, no, I worked my ass off, bro. This isn't the only house that I'm looking at. I, I go through hundreds of houses to find you a deal. I get paid because I support my family. Just like you get, like to get paid, I like to get paid because it all works. Are you happy? Yeah, but one guy out of 500 plus deals. Is he um, about 10 more? He bought about 10 more and then he did something else. Okay, so double escrow is a simultaneous closing. You buy one, sell, or you buy one and sell it at the same time. Has two double. It has two escrow keys. You hold have a hold open policy on the first leg, which is the purchase. Second leg is less in escrow fees. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, assignment. You're gonna save money at title because there's only one set of fees. It's easier. There's less moving parts. The investor's gonna know what you paid. Double escrow, a little bit more fees. It's on average, we use first years on the title. It's on average about $1,200 more. I'll gladly pay $1,200 to keep my, my earnings private to the, to the, to the contract. Um, it's important. The reason why is investors, they don't care about how much money you make. They're concerned about what they're making. That's just human nature. So. Oh yeah, double escrow. Do you have to use like transactional funding to make the first one close to then the second one, or are you using an authorization for you to buy or sell the first transaction, second one? So I'll go through and I'll put the earnest money deposit down on the buyer's leg. Then I charge five grand non-refundable on the on the second buyer's leg, on the investor's leg. So oftentimes that check will even beat my check there. So then I use their funding to fund this deal to close this deal. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Do it all the time. We have fantastic escrow officers. All right, fix, fix and flip joint venture. I just am finishing one of these. Um, I coach and teach people how to fix and flip. It's an art. Everybody thinks that just watching Johanna on BYI, you know everything. Um, you don't. People don't. So I help people with budgeting, but just staying within, we gotta stay in our lane. Most, where most people mess up is they wanna overbuild, over decorate, over, over, over. And once you spend so much, then they're like, oh, just increase the price. Well, that's why we talked about appraised value. You can't just keep increasing the price. There's a limit on what this thing's worth. I'm walking through one of these right now. So on a fix and flip, if you do it yourself, uh, you need to have some type of source of capital. We showed on the front slot on the house cost worksheet, that deal needed approximately $58,000. So you need some cash, capital, you need carry. You don't wanna be, put all your cash in this and now you can't pay for school lunch for your kid. Be responsible, have some residual, have some reserve so you can pay your bills. Uh, you need to know trade contractors or do, do you have some ZYI knowledge? It's your risk it. It's your own risk it. That's, you have to understand you're on the hook for this. You have to have decorator insight and adhere to a budget if you're doing your own fix and flip. If you're doing a joint venture, when I joint venture with people, I am their coach. I am their mentor. I make money on the wholesale and selling it to them. I automatically get the listing. I list it at a half a percent. We split whatever profits there. My earnings are giving knowledge and teaching and introducing trade partners and helping them along so eventually they don't need me anymore and can do it themselves. That's how I structure my joint ventures. Um, I have no financial, I pull no money out of my pocket in this deal. Their responsibility is the financing. Make sense? Resources. Here are a few of our hard money lenders that we use. I usually have, I have access to 12. Title companies. Of all the pictures you take, this is the one you really need to take. Um, I know we're not supposed to have favorites, so I'm going to tell you who my favorites are anyway. Um, King Stembridge at First Arizona Title. I have 
She has hit everything. I've never been able to stump her, and she keeps me out of hot water because sometimes my creativity gets me to the beyond. So she keeps me within my lane. Um, I've used Kim Gritz, Shell Davis. Uh, she was actually the first paddle and Usher officer we ever used. Uh, Nahomi, Nahomi and Shelly Reese, Empire West. All these folks are fantastic. All right, I also teach a wholesale masterclass. Today, the purpose of today was to get your whistle wet. Does this interest you? Is this something that you would be want to incorporate within your business structure? Are you looking for another revenue stream? If so, I offer a six day or six hour class. It's nine fifty a seat, and we go over all of this. Create an LLC and why? I'm going to teach you how to do it from inception. How to create an LLC? Why do you need it? Why is it important? Develop an investor database. We talked about it briefly, but I'm going to show you how to do it. What are the appropriate steps? Brand yourself a wholesaler. What does the branding look like? How do you do that? How to engage social media and to market your wholesale business. We also go <coughs> how to properly evaluate rehab. We were talking about that earlier. How most wholesalers say it's only this much money to rehab. It's not the truth. I want to go through how to do that. How to responsibly <coughs> diagnose ARV. Finding leveraging our money lenders. Working with other wholesalers, like you mentioned, to provide that product for your business. What that looks like. Um, call scripts. We actually make phone calls during this and set appointments every time, every time. So our next wholesale class, which I didn't change the date, the master class is on uh, February 22nd in the West Valley. We go from nine to three. Um, I'll send you an email with more information about it. If it's something you're interested in, you know, your payment reserves your seat. Does anybody have questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, one thing uh, that you didn't address is pre-foreclosure and the ability for us to identify, you know, through Monsoon. Mm -hmm. What's your theory on that? I talk about that in the class. And the theory, I'll give you a hint, 90% of that, 90% of that is um, uh, just people declaring bankruptcy. And they're not actually going to get foreclosed on the house. Right. So, Makes sense. But we, we have a bidding service at, at the, the auction. We have all kinds of resources. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Juan Bernice Mills, Jim Gessner. The name sounds familiar, yeah. Or Jay Tyson. I do, yeah. Yeah. Friends of mine. Oh, well, good. That's good. We've had other people that have taken similar classes. The information we go over in this six hour class is compared to what you would get on a weekend with some of the other names in town. Um, they charge thousands. Uh, one of the people that are, are investors. Uh, got burned for about a hundred grand out of an outfit for the same information. The price tag that's associated with this is, yeah, it's a revenue stream for me, but it's for you. If I give you free information, are you going to use it? You spend money on it, what are you going to do? More likely. Um, the folks that have taken this class, those who have gone through, we've closed 100, over $150,000 in wholesale. Any other questions? Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.